Gators in the spring. Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, talking Florida football. We've got uh, Jackie Franchuli on the line from uh, Rivals Platform for Florida football and athletic. It's uh, Gators territory. Jackie, how are you doing today? I'm great. How are you doing, Mark? Doing great. Thanks for stopping by. And uh, want to remind everyone that we talk with the best bloggers, broadcasters, and writers in the industry, plus analysis from myself each and every day. So lock it in right here with the, your uh, subscription and uh, like the video, share them uh, to your uh, Florida family, friends, your social media acquaintances, certainly. So spring football's in the books, 15 sessions, including the spring game. Uh, a lot to, to talk about, but in particular, I know, Jackie, that you're you're locking in on the safety position because there's just so many question marks, defensive line, a depth concern. Yeah, so um, basically what um, we, sh we kind of demonstrated in the spring game was there's some concern in the secondary for Florida right now. Um, when we saw the spring game, the defense struggled. Now, to, to be fair, um, both Grantham and Mullen said that their defense was a little bit more vanilla than normal. They didn't, you know, open the playbook as often. But at the same time, you, although they didn't open the playbook, that doesn't mean that you can excuse safeties to be out of position, which they were. There are several occasions where safeties were out of position. Um, at the moment, you know, when you look at it, it looks like Brad Stewart and Donovan Steiner have been taking a lot of reps with the first team. Um, but that also could be the case because J1 Taylor – was injured a couple game, a couple practices before the spring game, so he didn't factor into the spring game. Um, but when you look back, you can see J1 Taylor and Brad Stewart took a lot of the first team reps during spring, and then Donovan Steyer took some second team, but they got beat quite often. Um, and that's a question mark that we even had last year and the season was that the safety position was caught out a lot of times and were beat. And that's something that we're going to look at to see what Florida does. Um, Trey Dean was moved to the star position this year, replacing Chauncey Garner Johnson. Um, he showed that that position is something that he feels comfortable in. Obviously, he's still learning. We don't expect him to learn a new position overnight, but he showed he had good progress. Now, the one guy that really impressed many of the people on this beat was John Huggins. He's number two behind Trey Dean at the star position. Um, during the spring game, he had a, a pick six. And during the spring, he was the, probably the most improved player on this roster. Um, he's night and day from last year. This is the second season. He contributed a lot in special teams last year, but he grew a lot. Um, and it seems like the star position fits him so well, but then he can also kind of sneak in and go into that safety position. And I think there's an argument to be said that maybe you should, that the staff might try to feel the need to move Huggins back to safety if their safeties don't perform. And that's something that we're going to be trying to see what's going to happen in the off season. But also you can also say Trey Dean might move to safety and John Huggins can be at star because he does show that he is able to play that position. So it's an area that we're going to be focusing on in the off season because there's got to be a change in that position if they want to succeed in the secondary. Now on the flip side, the O-line as well is one area where there's a little bit of a concern between the first and the second team. Um, John Hevesy has said that, you know, it's, it's not going to be an overnight change. Um, it just look at the second team that was made up in the spring game. Most of those guys were true freshmen. Uh, Florida had four offensive linemen that came in as early enrollees. So those guys were taking lots of reps of the first team, second team, and third team. Something that generally you don't see that often, but because Florida lost so much from the last season to this season, they're going to have to try to bring in these younger guys um, in a lot earlier. So I expect like guys like King Keelingsley Egocon, which I'm probably betraying his name, mm -hmm. but um, he actually took some reps in the second team at center behind Nick Buchanan. And I, I did see a steady progress with him, but obviously the first team has guys that has had some game time experience. The second team almost had no game time experience. You're going to see that drop off, and that's something that this offseason, Hevesy and Mullen, um, you know, looking through film, those are the guys that are going to have to really kind of up their game a little bit, and that's something that we're going to be watching because there's no doubt in the first game the O-line is going to struggle with the second team rotation. These guys, that'll be the first time they're playing college football, most of these guys. So that's something that's going to be progress through the year. And it's going to be interesting to see how Mullen kind of adapts by his play calling. Because that's something that we've seen earlier in last year where Mullen kind of changed the way he play called in a few games because he was trying to hide the fact that the O-line was still trying to find the best rotation, trying to find the best fit. So, Jackie, do you think it's a situation, whether it be safety or on the offensive line, where – 
based on the recruiting and the expectations of the players coming in uh, onto campus that, hey, we've got the guys that uh, we need. They just need to be coached up. They they lack experience. Maybe they're they're slow in developing at this point. Or, you know, these are a bunch of two and three stars. I doubt two stars. But, you know, not necessarily guys that you would expect to, to be vying for positions of depth uh, at Florida. But we're just going to have to patchwork it together with guys that aren't necessarily where we need to be someday. Yeah, well, the problem with the O-line was that there was a few recruiting cycles where they just didn't get that many O-lines. So when Hevesy and Mullen came to Gainesville, they were actually working with a deficit. Um, so they needed to really kind of regroup and get as much O-line as possible during their two classes, which they did. They recruited many offensive linemen. And they kind of built their depth that way. So now you're, you're looking into these guys now developing. So that's why they're so young. Um, you can't fault this staff. This is really a problem that started with the former staff. Um, so now they're just kind of catching up. And these guys are, are trying to develop them a little further. So that, that's what the case of the O-line. Now with the safety, it's another it's another issue with depth. They just had so much bad luck. Um, don't forget, Randy Russell was a safety that they recruited a few years ago, but then couldn't play anymore due to a heart condition. And then another safety, um, or DB, he could play safety or cornerback, was Justin Watkins. He was kicked off the team um, after some domestic violence allegations. And so to be fair to the staff, they were dealing with uh, some death issues right off the bat when they got to Florida. So that's that's what they're doing right now. And that's what they did last recruiting class. They were able to bring like Kayer Elam is uh, not an early enrollee. He'll be going into summer. He's a corner. Um, but then you got Jaden Hill that could possibly go to safety. He was an early enrollee, but he had an ACL tear during his senior year in high school, so he couldn't factor in in the spring. Don't forget you have Marco Wilson that didn't factor in in the spring. He's a cornerback, so he can kind of go back to his position opposite C.J. Henderson. And although Chris Steele is a corner, um, he's got that body and frame that could possibly move to safety if you're in really dire straits. So now they have the bodies that they were missing last year. Because don't forget, last year they also missed out on Sean Davis for a few games after he was hurt. And he was hurt for a few practices early on in the spring as well. So a lot of this was just numbers. It was some bad luck with you know, medical issues, uh, an arrest, and then afterwards um, some injuries early on in the season where they had to move Iverson Clement, a freshman running back, to safety just so they had numbers um, at that position to practice. So I think once they have their back healthy and they're able to get some of the younger talent on campus, they'll be able to move forward and have a little bit more success in that position, but they will also be recruiting that position heavily um, come this recruiting cycle because I think safety and defensive tackle are the two positions that they need to focus on moving forward. Got Jackie Franchuli on the line from uh, Gators Territory. Join her right there on the Rivals platform for Florida Athletics. This is Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football discussion, debate, and analysis each and every day. If you want to help us uh, build the channel, just grab the Amazon link in the description section below. Do your Amazon shopping there. doesn't cost you a penny and helps us build the channel and keep the content coming. Of course, subscribe, share the videos, like, and comment. All right, recruiting. I guess the best way to draw recruits, if you don't know any other way, is you throw a barbecue. Uh, everybody loves barbecue, especially football players. Uh, just hopefully they they ordered enough for a couple weeks from now. <laughs> yeah, uh, Florida will hold their annual grill out. This is something that Mullen and their staff kind of started once they arrive. Um, it'll be on May 17th. And we've got a lot of visitors already saying that they're going to be there. Um, it's going to also be a key official visitor weekend. Um, obviously, now with the early signing period, they're able to come in in the spring and take their official visits early. Um, just some of the guys, um, Josh Braun is an offensive lineman. Um, his brother, uh, Parker Braun, was someone that they were kind of going after. Um, obviously, he didn't choose Florida, but, you know, the Braun family is really well known among Florida, and they really like John Hevesy. So it'll be interesting to see what brother's decision, kind of how that impacts Josh Braun. So he's set to schedule to go there. Uh, Fidel Diggs, a uh, four-star defensive end, he's set to be at Florida as well. Um, Major Burns, he is a uh, three-star corner out of Louisiana. He's set to be there at Florida. And a uh, four-star defensive tackle, Brannard Wright, will also be at Florida. Now, like I said, defensive tackle is a position that Florida is going to really recruit in this class. It's If you look down and break down the scholarship numbers, they only have one underclassman at DT right now, and that's Jalen Humphreys. He'll be early, he'll be um, enrolling in the summer. That's not something that they want. Most of the guys at the D line right now are upperclassmen. 
a lot of them will be leaving next year. So they really need to work on those numbers, um, either by grad transfers or transfers right now, they're looking to the transfer portal or by going to the recruiting side as well. So that's something that they kind of noticed that they have a problem with. They don't have the numbers there and that's something they're going to focus on. And that's that's why this grill out is so important because they want to bring as many of those guys now. Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football, breaking down the Gators. And we do so with Jackie Franchuli from Gators Territory. It's on the Rivals platform. Join her and the rest of the staff right there for Florida football coverage like few others. Uh, we've talked uh, spring football. We've talked recruiting. And then the other end of that pipeline, of course, was the NFL draft uh, three to four years later. And a lot of college football fans uh, disregard the draft. Hey, these guys are gone. Don't care. See ya. Hopefully uh, you do well, but I'm not going to be watching you on Sunday. We're we're locked in on college football. I hear that, but I also hear there's some there being some pride taken in. Our conference has the most selections in the SEC. My team has more draft selections than yours does. They're better pros over the last ten years than your team. And um, in rating the development process and the recruiting uh, of Dan Mullen, of course, it's not just what happened at Florida. It's more so what's happened at Mississippi State, a team that has not flooded the NFL draft with prospects in the past, but set a record for the school with three products from the Dan Mullen regime moving on to the NFL. So that says a lot for Mullen. Yeah. Um, and the NFL draft is huge for college football programs because this is a recruiting tool that they can use. Um, what better way to recruit a prospect than say, hey, did you see that guy playing in the NFL? I coached him. I developed him. And now he's getting millions of dollars doing what he loves. And that's what Mississippi State was, you know, the years that Nolan had in Mississippi State, he's able to do that now. Um, seeing what those defensive linemen did and what they've accomplished by going to the NFL, you can say, hey, Dan Mullen was able to identify talent that was not highly rated um, and then turn those guys into NFL prospects. And that's something that you can, you know, talk to parents and talk to these players and say, this is what I was able to accomplish. Guys like Alex Smith, who's still in the NFL, was coached by Dan Mullen. Um, so having that resume will, you're not just talking. You're, you've actually done those things. And that's something that any college program would love to have. Um, the other side of this is also that Dan Mullen and his staff has been able to get um, a little bit more of the faith in a locker room um, just because of the way they're able to identify talent. Um, what, by, what I mean is, you know, when back in November, Dan Mullen said that they didn't have any player that, that he thinks they would be able to go pro right away and either underclassmen. And at the end of the day, he was right. He said there was no first rounders, and he was proved right. Um, Grantham even said that Jakai Polite needed one more year. He said he wasn't mentally ready yet to go through the draft, the draft process. And Grantham was right. Jakai Polite str struggled during the pre-draft process with interviews. He didn't perform well in the NFL Combine. He didn't perform well in the Pro Day. And he admitted um, during Pro Day that he just wasn't mentally ready. So by then, like basically, they didn't just talk about it. So they said it in November, December, and January. And then suddenly now in May, in April and May, they were proven right. So the locker room, so next year when these underclassmen, these juniors are going to talk to Mullen and say, hey, what do you think? They're going to listen now. Because um, at the end of the day, these still are young men. These are Some of these are still teenagers. So sometimes when an adult tells you not to do it, what are you going to do? Do it. <laughs> So at least this way, they've had like you know evidence. They actually see it happen, and then they also see like guys at Mississippi State where the guys said, "Hey, you know, Grantham told some of those D linemen that went early, said, hey, wait another year, and look, they were able to go in the first round just by waiting another year.' So now they have evidence backing things that they've set up. So now when you know guys next year like C.J. Henderson or Marco Wilson, they're going to be able to enter the NFL draft next year. They can go up to Mullen and Grantham and say, "What do you think?" And they're more likely to listen now. It's a great point, Jackie, and also by extension, 
that uh, you can buy into the thought, well, if you want to play in the NFL, you can pretty much go anywhere these days. It's not like it's 1960 where you've got to go to Alabama or Ohio State to go to the NFL. Everybody's on TV. There's full exposure. You can go to Washburn, and there were players drafted from the NFL. Old Dominion had two players drafted to the NFL over the weekend. There's game tape on everyone. Everyone's on TV. But you increase your chances exponentially. Yes, you can go to any program it doesn't have to be a big time winner to go to the nfl every program in the power five has multiple draft choices over the course of years the group of five but i think you make a great point in terms of we see it every year and we just saw it over the weekend it was astonishing to see about 40 players declare early and not get drafted make that mistake believing that they would be drafted and drafted high and they weren't even drafted at all. And that doesn't even count the seniors that went to major programs like a Florida or a Georgia or fill in the blank that didn't get drafted, that that coaching and development increases your chances. And if the coach, in fact, can prove that regardless of his locale, his school, that he develops your position, develops people in general for the next level, then, then uh, that's certainly a great recruiting tool. Yeah, no doubt. And don't forget, Todd Grantham coached in the NFL and still has contracts in the NFL. So that also helps. And, you know, when Dan Mullen, you know, is talking to Bill Belichick at the NFL, at their pro day in Gainesville, that also helps recruiting as well. That's just optics. Anything that you can do to promote your program in this day and age is, is great for the program. And Dan Mullen gets it. We always enjoy the conversation with Jackie Franchuli from Rivals. You can catch her and the rest of the staff there at uh, Gators Territory. And, of course, right here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. Jackie, hope you have a great day. Thanks for stopping by. Thanks for having me, Mark.